Uh, during this time, I would say, we heard all the talk about war. We were sitting with our friends in the uh, lobby of this hotel, discussing, like, there's no way that there could something like this be happening in our age. And Welcome to Storytelling Ukraine, the podcast of amazing stories. Please make sure to listen till the end, because the best stories are told when the guests are about to leave. And I'm very happy to welcome our guest today, Ali Derkachov. Hello, Ali. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you for finding the time. I know it's uh, not that <laughs> easy, right? And no. uh, so I really appreciate it that you found the time to come here. And uh, the typical first question that we ask all the guests is, how did it happen that you actually have a Ukraine story to share? Uh, so, actually, my mom is Ukrainian. So we could say I'm part Ukrainian, and uh, she was born in Lviv, personally, but she came to the States at a very young age, around 25 years old. So she's been there, she's lived there from 25 on, and uh, also my grandfather, obviously, he is also Ukrainian, and he also lives in the States, so all my family is in the States, but he's been telling me about Ukraine all my life, I've heard all these stories, he's like a Ukrainian fanatic, we could say. Okay. He loves his country a, a lot. And I've always wanted to visit it because he's told me all these things about Ukraine, but I never obviously live in, in the States. I've never even thought it would be possible this young for me to even come here and to start living here. Um, but I did live in Poland uh, prior to coming to Ukraine for about a year or so. And... I decided with my mom uh, to come to Ukraine for two weeks just to see it, take a quick trip, and for her to show me around a little bit. Uh, she ended up leaving after the two weeks, and I ended up staying. Okay. So <laughs> these two weeks turned into three months, because obviously I can only stay here for three months as a U.S. citizen. Uh, I ended up finding friends. Uh, I ended up finding my, I guess, community, we could say, and... Uh, I quickly became involved in the beauty industry, and soon after, I started teaching ESL. All right, all right. So, so that's quite a story. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, your mom uh, took you here to show you around Ukraine, and then mm -hmm. here, well, there we go. Yeah. Yes. And that was my first time, I guess we could say, all right. being in Ukraine, okay. before coming back the second time. Okay. So how did it happen that you came here the second time? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so I ended up, obviously, going back to the States. Uh, and I stayed there for around six months. I understood that, you know, like the perfect, my age, I'm supposed to go to school, university, I'm yeah. supposed to, you know, start my life, uh, get a car, get an apartment, go to university, just the usual American, dream. American uh, lifestyle, I would say. <laughs> uh, and I ended up doing those things. I did sign up to go to a school for accounting. I did get a new apartment. I moved from the Bay Area to Orange County, California. Uh, and I also got a new car. So I got all those things, obviously, while being there, but I still had some things, some business that I had to finish in Ukraine, some things to grab, to bring back. So I was planning on coming here for actually only a month. Okay. Uh, this month. I uh, turned to three years in April very quickly, I would say. Yeah. Uh, so it was uh, quite interesting, I would say. But uh, after this month, I actually uh, had a friend. So I had very close friends here, but they had ended up leaving. Uh, one's actually in Australia, one's somewhere else. But I had nobody to talk to. I was like, okay, why don't I? I want to go out. I want to go to a cafe. I want to go out of for a night sure. in town, maybe we could say, uh, while I'm still here, and I ended up downloading a dating app. Okay. <laughs> Something I've never done. Okay. Never done. There's always this first time, you know. <laughs> but it was only for friends. Like, I didn't want nothing. I didn't, obviously, I knew it was going to win back. I didn't want a relationship. I didn't want friends and benefits, you could say. Right. Uh, I even put the controls to girls and guys because I was very strict, just friends just to go to a cafe or something like this of this sort. Uh, but I ended up meeting my, my now husband. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we did 
uh, end up meeting and he caught my eye because he was fit. He had a motorcycle. My dream is motorcycles. Okay. So I've always wanted to get my license and all that. And uh, he ended up picking me on my motor on his motorcycle. Um, oh, romantic. Yeah. It's like a, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, going a, on a ride around town. And after that, seven months later, we're proposed. Or he proposed to me. Okay. Uh, so this is actually around... February, uh, two years ago, and we ended up going to Carpathian Mountains. So this was not too long uh, before war began, uh, but we ended up going. So obviously we're dating now, and we go on a trip with our friends to Carpathian Mountains. Okay. Uh, during this time, the last day we were there, he ended up proposing. Uh, very quickly, I would okay. say. Something not very expected. And uh, we ended up going home that day. <laughs> uh, during this time, I would say, we heard all the talk about war. We were sitting with our friends in the uh, lobby of this hotel, discussing, like, there's no way that there could something like this be happening in our age. And uh, something that was talked about, but nobody really took serious, I would say. Nobody that I have talked to, everyone was saying, no, there's no way. Something like this could happen. And we were also, like, talking about this. There's no way, there's no way. Obviously, we were still, like, you know, had our thoughts because it's a big situation. It was talked about 24-7, but we still didn't believe it. Okay. Uh, we ended up going home. And a week later, obviously, we woke up to the sound of airplanes and bombs, explosions. So. And you went back to Kiev, right? Yeah, we went back to Kiev. So... A week before the start of war, we were living in Kyiv, quiet, calm, and the day of war. Everything like, changed. Yeah, everything changed, and we understood this is really our reality now. Yeah. Uh, we did end up uh, running. As soon as we heard this, I didn't even w wake up to the first uh, plane. I woke up to the explosions, and as soon as I heard that, I jumped from bed. I didn't even know what was happening, I could say, and... Uh, I ran to get our documents to get clothes packed to because we didn't really expect to. I didn't have nothing packed at this point. Uh, looking through the shelves of our kitchen to find foods that wouldn't expire so we could actually right. use something uh, wherever we go. So we knew we needed to go somewhere. We didn't know where. Um, but we did have a vacation home uh, outside of Kiev. So before we went, we ended up going to the grocery store, our local grocery store in our town. Uh, one thing I did notice was there was no bread, full of people. This grocery store is full of people, but everything obviously started being taken. But the one thing I do remember was there's no bread right. at all, which I found very interesting. Yeah. Why bread? Uh, is something I noticed. Uh, but we did end up going to uh, our vacation home, which is, I don't know if you know, uh, Andreevki between Makarov and Borodanka. Yeah. Yes. So uh, we thought this was a safe choice. Okay. Uh, we thought, you know, it was outside of Kiev, so it must be okay to go. Why not? We don't really have anywhere else to go. Uh, so we thought this was close. This was nearby. There's no way that anything would be going like would be going down there. So there was no reason for us to believe it wasn't unsafe. Unsafe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we ended up arriving, and the first day, obviously, you could hear explosions, you could hear all these noises, uh, but it suddenly turned much worse than, I would say, the city center of Kiev. Uh, that day, for the next 10 days, we would find ourselves living in a potato cellar okay. uh, underground uh, at our neighbor's house, because our house didn't have anywhere we were to go. Uh, I would say there were changes where we would uh, be able to stay inside, but many times we had to run to the potato cellar and we could be there for days at a time without entering or exiting because of the explosions, because of the uh, shots fired. You can hear it. You can hear the soldiers, the Russian, obviously, soldiers, marching on the street nearby. So it was very, very loud and prominent, I would say, and uh, 
some things I even remember was while we were there during these 10 days before we were able to get out was the way we would keep warmth because we didn't have electricity. We barely had water. Um, what did you eat? What we had at our place, we would go to the local store and this is a very, very tiny like corner type of store because in this village, there's not much. And also eventually it was broken into by Russians. Uh, which they obviously destroyed everything, but uh, we did end up going to the store and we got whatever we could. Uh, a lot of these neighbors, we would share things. So in a village, there's cows, there's animals, there's chickens, and uh, we would share whatever we had. And we was very, uh, I would say, very friendly. Something mm -hmm. that I've never experienced, people getting together, like when you know you have nothing, Yeah. And you don't know what, how long you're going to be here. And people are just sharing, which I thought was incredible. So we ate whatever we had left, whatever we could find at the grocery stores that was left. Uh, not much, usually the same thing or crackers or something like this. Sometimes uh, my mother in law would make something out of the vegetables that we had left over. Potatoes was a big thing because it was, there was yeah, in the cellar as well. So uh, it would depend. Were there any children left in the village? I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure there were. Uh, actually, we have a family in the village who also lived there. And uh, she had a daughter, or no, had a son recently. So her son, so my family's like sister, uh, they had a son a few months old only. So... Very brand new. So there were children, of course. Mm. Yeah. And the Russians, they actually occupied the village and stayed there, right? Yeah. So at first, while we were there, obviously the explosions are very loud. Very, very loud. You can hear them. You can see. Uh, we recently went back and you can see the windows and the curtains shaking every single time. Even in the distance, they could be far and you could hear the explosion, but you know it's not very close. But the windows, it was so strong. The windows and the curtains would shake. And I remember just laying on that bed. We were staying like all of us so far away from windows or as far as we could. Uh, but you could just feel it shaking and you're, you know, thinking about this. But, you know, you can't do anything anymore. Uh, they were at first outside of our, they weren't in on the street, specific street where the houses were, but they were outside the village. They were outside the village, kind of like circling it, we could say. And... Uh, this was actually a few days after, but they were walking around the main street to get from where they were to into Kiev. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is how they were positioned. Yeah, Maybe. so uh, you stayed in that village mm -hmm. uh, for about ten, ten days. Ten days, ten days. So what can you recall about those days? Um, Maybe not yeah. day by day, of course, because it was two years ago, but what are some of the moments that really stand out? I would say us obviously running back and forth, my family being in the States. My friends obviously have heard about this work, especially during the first few days. It was a very large topic, a very talked about topic. And there was no connection. That's what so, I was going to ask. No connection. So, no connection. No. But at the back of our house, so there's this house, there's like this yard with uh, fruit trees and behind it's like a field, an open field. And across from this field, there is more houses. Uh, and the only place that I could really get a connection to call my family was behind this house at the corner. Oh, no. uh, as we know, there were Russians standing all around this village. Who knows where they are? They can be in the forest. They can be to the left of you. They were obviously like in our backyard, but they were somewhere nearby. Right. Uh, but I need to call my family. I understood that who knows how long we have left because we understood how close the explosions were. And I remember one time I was on the phone with my family, uh, my parents, and I'm staying there obviously paying attention. We didn't know how stupid it was until we came back and realized how stupid we were going back there, but I had no choice. Uh, I really uh, obviously want to make sure that they knew I was okay that day. Uh, make sure that they knew or I was able to talk to them just in case things did happen. Yeah. 
Uh, so I remember one day I went outside, I was on the phone, and my mother-in-law comes out of the door. As soon as she comes out of the door, you just hear a rocket, either it was maybe shot down or just the rocket itself, flying past us, uh, very, very loud. And I, as soon as I hear this uh, <laughs> very loud noise, uh, and you hear this explosion somewhere nearby in the backyard, and I was sitting right uh, at the end of the house, uh, as soon as we hear this, obviously we drop. My mother's a mom is screaming, get down, run to the cellar. And we all get up and run straight to the cellar, to our neighbor's house. Uh, actually, in the cellar, we had about 10 people living in it. I would say it's the size of a bathroom, a regular sized bathroom. Half of it was filled with potatoes, so we had people sleeping on potatoes, and the rest of us were sit in chairs, and that's how we would sleep, and we couldn't. We would spend nights in there, so uh, it was definitely tough, especially with people snoring as well. There were people snoring, and uh, very dark, lots of insects, and uh, not a very uh, nice place where you would want to stay, I would say. Definitely. I can imagine. Uh, How did you keep warm? Was it coats? I, I jackets, it coats, we would put whatever we could okay. so on. So whatever we had uh, taken with us, we would put it on. Uh, so that's how we would keep warm because it was winter time at this time. It was February. So uh, here in Ukraine, it's definitely still very cold at this time. Uh, so yeah, whatever we had, we would put on. Uh, when we did have the chance to get out of the cellar, when it, it seemed to be quiet, we would go into our kitchen, close the door and turn on the stove, the gas stove. And we would use that. We turn on all the plates and that's how we would keep warm, really. So that's when we could really, really, I guess, stay warm. Now, I actually have videos of it. It's the craziest thing to look back on. Uh, but um, going back and forth was definitely crazy. There was times also where we went onto the patio of our neighbor's house. And during this one night, we were sitting on the patio, and all you see is this explosion that seemed like to be like fireworks that's how I remember it. it like it looked like fireworks but it was I don't uh, know the exact term for it but it was just like a burst of fire and sparks all through the air and it was very very close it was only a street or two away and uh, we're just sitting there and I'm in complete shock because you can see it and it's huge um, so it was quite uh, I would say scary uh, Something that uh, definitely took my breath away. Yeah. And so that was also a part. There was also parts where I think one of the most memorable things is I love snow. I love it, uh, especially in California. We don't get it very often unless you go into the mountains. And I remember one morning we ended up uh, thinking it was okay to go outside. It was okay. We didn't hear any noises or any strange sounds. So we ended up opening the doors and going outside. And it was snowing. Mm. Or we thought it was snowing. I'm like, it's snowing, it's snowing. And during this time, uh, I was trying to stay positive. I knew at any moment, because the cellar is very uh, dingy, we could say. it's The door is like this thin. Uh, it's behind a house. If something was to hit it, we would all be dead at that point. Uh, we knew this, but it was the only, it was the safest place we could go uh, during this time. But I remember we go out uh, and I'm screaming, it's snowing and we're getting excited or whatever. And a few minutes go by and we start looking at it and we notice it's not snow, but it's ashes. Ashes, oh my God. And you can imagine the amount of ashes in the air to look like snow, like it was actively snowing was crazy and it was a, it was really a realization I would say for me specifically because during this whole time I was always laughing I was very I would say I think maybe that's also how maybe how I deal with stress so I was very active and I was like smiling trying to be the positive one there while uh, us in the cellar you could hear the explosions very close you could hear the shots you don't know if somebody in the house is alive or not uh, because they started getting closer and closer and closer. Uh, so uh, the Russian soldiers specifically started getting closer and kind of like pushing us into one 
you know, little area. And uh, obviously we had people crying, screaming in the cellar. And I was laughing. I don't know what it was, but I was laughing, which was something that uh, my family keeps reminding me of. Like, in this situation, you were laughing. Like, are you kidding me? Like, you're about to, you know, yeah. maybe die, but you're, you're laughing. So it was also something that definitely I remember. So every time you were coming out from that cellar, you didn't actually know if there were Russian soldiers around because you only heard that, you know, there were no explosions, no gunshots. And so you just were coming out because you had to, obviously, right? Yeah. And, uh, but you never knew whether... Yeah, the men would go out first and we would follow. Uh, we would, had a fence, so where that cellar is, the door of the cellar, there was a fence surrounding it. And we would kind of peek through the fence to see because of the main road that was not that far from us. And you could see the main road from this uh, uh, section. Right. So we'd peek around and see if we could see anything, hear anything. And when it seemed to be safe, we would exit and we would kind of stand where the chickens are. <laughs> I guess uh, there's a chicken coop and, you know, yeah. uh, dirt, mud. Uh, it was very wet uh, season. So we would stand there uh, very dirty. Nobody's really taken a shower for 10 days because there was nowhere to go, which obviously has an effect in the small cellar. Yeah. Um, but at that point, it was the least of our worries. So that's also one thing. So uh, you stayed for 10 days and then you decided just yeah. you know, to leave, to go for it. So yeah. was it like a premeditated decision or there was something that made you leave that you, you really got scared or you thought that you couldn't mm -hmm. stay there any longer? Uh, well, there were also a few stories there was in this village a few days. They were looking, so the villagers, they were looking for somebody's head. So they found a body, but nobody could find a head for a few days, which was quite crazy. These events started piling. Obviously, there's a lot that you could talk about. These are just a few ones that really stuck out. You, we heard more and more stories of people being shot. Uh, elderly kids, adults, and we understood, like, it's not getting any better. It's not going to get any better, especially we're on the news. We're trying to find out anything we can. Uh, we're charging our phones in our cars. We don't have electricity to be able to charge our phone regularly. So we were really just out of resources, food was getting scarce, uh, so we really needed to uh, weigh out. But because of the Russians, they were in our village, we had a neighbor also go outside. Uh, he was under the influence, we could say, but he did go outside and kind of where they were. And he started talking to them. They took him hostage. Uh, and he also described, you know, who he was with. And we understood that if not safe, uh, we don't know what they know about us. Uh, we know that they're getting closer. Uh, and it was soon that they would come in. And uh, quickly before I move on. Uh, yeah, I wanted to also share that when they were around and perhaps a Russian soldier saw you or saw you were on the phone or saw you take a picture of them, they would shoot you. Mm. They would come from their line come to your door, open the cellar. Some were nice. Some we heard were on the nicer side. They would maybe take your phone and, you know, be able to have it, to be able to call or have connection. Uh, but many would take your phone, shoot you, kill you, and you can't do nothing about it. Mm -hmm. And especially if they saw you uh, taking a picture. It was, they were coming towards you, to you, opening that cellar door where you were hiding, opening your, your house where you were hiding, and killing uh, for this reason, so we understood that we had to really get out as fast as we could. Uh, after this, we had a chance. We, as a village, were trying to figure out how to get out, how to get out of this situation. Uh, there were kids, there were adults, there were people that are slowly minimizing. So we're like, we have to get out somehow. And uh, the men would go and survey the area at night and see, you know, where they were, what was kind of happening. And we had one night, one day, one morning where we found an exit way. And people who live in this village, they know this village by heart. They know the ins and the outs. Most of them have been living there since childhood. Uh, so we understood there was one way out, or one way possible, one possible way out. 
and we decided to take that chance because we understood we won't have much longer here. It was definitely probably the most terrifying thing during this whole time for me personally. Um, so we had a group of 10 cars. We were supposed to get in a line all together and go. Uh, the first section was about 10 cars. Uh, we didn't get ready in time to go with them, so they had exited. Uh, and we then got another uh, group of 10 cars about, maybe a little bit less, also to go. Uh, we were the first car. Uh, so it was also uh, really based on my father-in-law and his sense. He grew up in this village, so he knows it very uh, well. But it was his duty to really lead us through the forest. Uh, there was only one way out, one possible way out that we could think of, and it was through this uh, field that I was talking about and into the forest. Uh, during this ride, obviously, we are all sitting with the first car, and we are all just praying out loud. Literally, you can just hear um, my sister-in-law praying, crying, uh, my husband, or soon-to-be husband, also you know, try and comfort everybody. My mother-in-law, she's like also looking, we're all looking at our phones to be able to find like kind of loopholes around. Uh, so we're going through this forest driving, uh, trying to find like the main road to get out and into, uh, we were planning on going to Lviv. Right. Because it was a bit quieter than where we were. Uh, and it was safer. Uh, so we're going through this and it was definitely very, very scary. I remember I always get emotional uh, during this time, but I remember as soon as we get on to, uh, or we go into the forest, I end up texting all my family, uh, I love you. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> it gets, this part always gets emotional for me. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. I remember we also did an interview, actually in Poland, when, we go, when me and my sister-in-law left. And they also asked us questions that we couldn't, we were a mess. We were really a mess. And that's when I noticed that we were not okay. We thought we were okay until we started getting actually also interviewed when we got out. Mm -hmm. um, but I did text my family. I love you guys. Uh, it's my mom, my brother, uh, my dad. Um, I love you. And we were going through this forest. We didn't know what was to happen. Uh, obviously, soldiers were everywhere, and they are in the forest. They, are, they have put uh, bombs here, bombs there. You don't know where you're going to step. Uh, and during this uh, trip, uh, having several cars in one line, it brought us dust. Right. As soon as we turned left, I remember we were shot at. Uh, we believe it was a tank. It sounded like it. Uh, the way... Uh, the explosion reacted. It sounded, we, we seemed to, uh, we agreed so that it was a tank. Probably. The Russian tank was uh, shooting at a group of 10 civilian cars. Yeah, okay. yeah. Just, just to get this straight, yeah? Yeah. So a Russian soldier from a Russian tank sees a group of 10 civilian cars trying to escape and shoots at them. Uh, we don't know if they really saw us, they saw dust. Okay. So. But you would assume, because there was no Ukrainian soldiers in this area, they were on the streets, they were uh, in other areas, so you would assume, and we told, or somebody I believe told the Russian soldiers that were on our side, uh, because we were informed by the Russian soldiers to get out, because the next, the troops that are coming after us, they will kill you all. Okay. So we did have a few good soldiers, and they... Uh, Told us get out now before it's too late uh, as well. And yeah, so the dust uh, that was created from our cars uh, had a shot at. And also, we've coming across this, uh, we turned right onto a bridge, for example. And there, there was just a tank. We didn't know it was destroyed at that time, but there was just a tank, a Russian tank. Everyone's in panic. Everyone's crying in the car because we know we know it's like it's over for us. There's no, there's no, there's you know, yeah. it's over. Uh, but thankfully, it was destroyed. Uh, that we will soon later found out, and thankfully, meeting our Ukrainian soldiers, yeah. and we were we were able to take a breath of fresh air and uh, kind of move on from this. Do you remember this the one. date? What day was it? 
Ten days after occupation. Okay. Perfectly ten days. Okay. So, so yeah. around March 2nd. Yeah, no, yeah, around this time. Okay. So, it was definitely experience before, obviously. March we 4th. Yeah. yeah, packed all of our things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I don't know, I'm sure it was shown where white was the color that these are civilians. Right. Uh, we also ripped up all of our bedding that we had that was white, all of our curtains that were white, and we put it all over the car right. uh, in knots to show. But we did have, on our way, there were a lot of cars destroyed, a lot of cars that were obviously shot at. Mm -hmm. You could see the, um, the shots, and you could see what was left, a lot of cars that were burned. And these are obviously civilians, and you just... It's scary because, you know, they were kids, they were adults, they were people that were not involved in this at all. Not at all. And they were in this mid-fire. Uh, so we did hear that there were things happening on this road, but this was the only way out. So we didn't have really much choice. Uh, so there was a lot of tragedies uh, along the way. Gas was scarce as well. Lines for gas were crazy. Uh, People would fill up tanks, uh, they would fill up the gallons yeah. that they could, whatever they could find, and uh, it was hard to find it, I remember, so we got whatever we could, thankfully we had people from the village that gave it to us. Not everyone did leave the village, unfortunately. Um, um, do you know what happened to them? Yeah, uh, the day after, the li exact day after, the morning after we left, uh, we heard that Russians physically entered the streets, physically started entering our houses. Uh, they entered our house as well. Uh, people who stayed, if they wanted something of theirs. Uh, actually, I wasn't, I forgot about this story, uh, but our family house, our extended family's house, not mine specifically, but my uh, husband's side, uh, the one whose parents, uh, their aunt and uncle, and their daughter, uh, who had a new baby at that time. Uh, they all left except for the men in that family. So the men stayed. And they were shot and killed during this time because they were standing on their yard. The Russians didn't like that they had a phone in their hands, and they were shot and killed straight for just standing on their yard. That house was later shot up. The baby bed, for whatever reason, was all shot up that you could see the holes through this baby bed. For whatever reason, I don't know what they thought or what they did, but this whole, I'm even getting a response from this, this baby bed was shot, shot up fully, completely into shreds. Baby clothes were shot. Uh, obviously everything else in that house was pretty much destroyed. Uh, our house was also destroyed, uh, not as bad. Uh, I don't know if this is too much information it's not too or much. not, but uh, after entering this house, after uh, it was safe to go and uh, Russians weren't in Kiev anymore, uh, my father-in-law did come back, check it out, and the first door, the front door, uh, he showed, and we can still see to this day, uh, they were throwing knives just for fun. It was their game to just throw knives at the door, and you can see the marks that it left. Uh, going to the house, obviously paintings were destroyed, they ended up destroying that they took whatever they could find of value uh i don't know if uh it was talked about or not but toilets were taken yeah toilets like yes. <laughs> toilets okay uh very strange uh but we had a toilet in our vacation home we had a toilet there but they decided to use the bathroom next to beds so you could see not only I guess you can number one, I don't want to say on the camera, but you could see feces, human feces, just on the ground next to beds for whatever reason. I don't know what it was. There was a literal working bathroom, toilet that would work, but they decided to use the floor. Which, mir. <laughs> which, was, which was quite crazy. I don't know. Uh, I've never heard of anything before like this. I didn't think something like this would even, you know. I guess they haven't seen a real toilet before. <laughs> I guess not. It was... Uh, I can't think shocking. of any other reason. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, you know, just... Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> something yeah. that you wouldn't imagine. So, yeah. uh, unfortunately, uh, the next day after we left, 
we were very lucky to get out because of all you. We hear what happens to women. We hear what happens to men. Uh, during this time, we saw it for our, ourselves. Uh, so we were very lucky to get out the day before they really entered the village, before the tanks were in the backyard, specifically in our backyard. We have also people who stayed. They didn't kill all. They, they didn't kill all, but they killed a lot. Uh, so people who were still there, they would share their stories, what they saw. They would keep us kind of updated and they would show us videos of Russian tanks really in our backyard the next day. How they were walking on our streets and so on. So it was definitely, we were very, very, very lucky yeah. to even get out of their life. And, yeah. And you went to Lviv, right? Yeah, and we drove down to Lviv. Uh, we stayed there for a few days. Uh, and then me and my sister-in-law decided... Uh, my father actually came from the States. Okay. He was always terrified. Sure. And uh, he had picked us up from Lviv. And we exited to Poland. I remember entering Poland. It was crazy. The amount of people, the amount of talking, the amount of volunteers. It was <laughs> quite a shit show, I would say. You wouldn't, like, the amount of people, and people are standing on these streets for hours, days, just to get through the border. Yeah. With tiny kids in this freezing cold, because it is winter time at this time. Uh, we were lucky to get there through it much quicker than others. Um, but it, I remember entering the door, or entering Poland, finally. The amount of help, people everywhere, the amount of clothes that people had for those who really needed it. The amount of food that they would bring. So there was a line for sandwiches, tea, things to get people warm, and uh, a lot of volunteers that would help. But it was quite, <laughs> I would say, it was quite the scene. A lot of people crying, a lot of unknown. So yeah, it was definitely much very sad. Uh, from there, we ended up going to the station, the train station, and uh, me and my sister-in-law, we lived on our own for about a month in Poland, and then we ended up taking a trip to France, Italy, you know, the dream. But, you know, everyone loves going to these places. It's, yeah. you know, it's a dream for many. Uh, but it was not, we thought that we would be okay. This is what I'm saying, we got interviewed and uh, we completely broke down. We d couldn't do it. We thought we were we were like, yes, please. And then we just couldn't do it. We, there was nothing coming out of us. And during this trip, obviously, we were very isolated to ourselves, I would say. Um, there was nothing except for crying, just, you know, worrying. We didn't really, obviously, we didn't enjoy this trip at all. We thought because I had to stay out for three months due to documents, due to being in citizen. Uh, we would enjoy it, at least enjoy it before we came back, because we didn't, we couldn't, we couldn't be in this area, even though we know it's safe, without worrying about our family, worrying about our friends, worrying about everyone who stayed back. So uh, we were very anxious to get back, even though obviously the situation wasn't uh, all that better. You could hear the, you, there are still explosions to this day, obviously. Sure. Uh, things that are happening in our areas and everywhere, everywhere around Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, but we definitely, I would say. So yeah. when did you start to feel better? Obviously, like you, you were like uh, in a state of shock mm -hmm. when you were staying in the occupied village and then, mm -hmm. you know, getting out, living through this hell and then, you know, not being able like to compose yourself. But eventually you started to feel better when what do you remember when when did it happen um <clears throat> fully better uh i would say never <laughs> um but i'm not saying not better in sense of like getting past this but you obviously are always worrying about something even it's going to be in the back of your mind especially when you're in this area Mm, but I would say when we start to be okay openly talking about it probably like a month and a half two months 
Okay. Where we were able to talk more and more about it. So we slowly started sharing. Obviously, with the family, we could share it. Uh, we would talk about it. I would talk to my family what happened and the situation. But it wasn't something that you really want to share to everyone. It was quite, I would say, personal. It was quite scary to even speak about it, to put it out in the open. Yeah. Your mind was very scattered. So. Yeah. I would say two months before I was like fully, you felt, you know, a little bit better, but still, you still had that, you know, thought. Yes, absolutely. So now it's two years since the start of the war. Yeah. And you're still in Ukraine. Yeah. And um, how do you feel about living in Ukraine now? <laughs> uh, obviously, I have a child now. Actually, uh, we ended up coming back from three days, and a few days passed, and I am pregnant. So <laughs> it didn't take long after coming back. <laughs> uh, so uh, had a baby. I was fine here. Uh, you know, explosions. We could hear it when I was, you know, uh, pregnant. And I was climbing ten flights of stairs, eight months pregnant, uh, because we had no ex electricity. Uh, we were, but I was fine. I would say I didn't really like, you know, you would hear it, but I would sleep through it or try to sleep through it. We would go into the hallway. Sometimes if it was like a really, it was like really loud. Uh, of course we would freak out, but it wasn't, I would say at this point now. So I ended up obviously giving birth here in Kiev and giving birth and walking out of this hospital during the air uh, uh, siren. So air sirens were obviously a thing. Uh, quite a crazy experience, obviously, uh, giving birth in this type of situation, being at the hospital during this type of situation where everyone's in the hallways. Uh, so she is, I guess we could say, a child of war. and uh, It's unfortunate, I would say. It's definitely unfortunate. But uh, having her, I would say, I freak, I start to really think about things and every single time we hear explosion, I start to freak out a lot more than I was when I was pregnant. For whatever reason, hormones or whatever's changed, but I cannot be in that room. As soon as you hear, I hear an explosion, I'm up with the baby running uh, into the hallway, getting her quickly dressed and out the door. Uh, we don't have a place where we could hide in our building. We had to actually cross the street mm. uh, to the garages. So, uh, as soon as, obviously, if we have an air alarm, I'm on my phone checking what's happening. There's no, usually it's during the night. So they like to attack during the night because yeah. people are sleeping. They like to cause something. Uh, but it's sad that I have to be with my child, my child that obviously can't even walk at this point. Uh, she can't even walk uh, in a hallway or in some garage to be able to have some sort of safety. Which isn't promised. No, at the end not of it. it's not promised. Not so it's very, it, it is scary. But I love Ukraine. I love being here. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's a, uh, yeah, it's quite a funny situation. Obviously, being an American citizen, I can go back. It's not an issue. Uh, exactly. But I have my family here, and I would say uh, to go back, also with a baby, it's a bit harder. So. Mm -hmm. I am planning on going and visiting, but for maybe a few weeks and then coming back. So sure, yeah. I do love Ukraine a lot. That's a good <laughs> enough <thing. laughs> to be here. <laughs> enough yeah. to be here. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know Ukraine very well now, yeah. and you have experienced, you know, basically all the horrors of war, just like mm. all the Ukrainians did. Yeah. and I can say that. You must know the answer to the question, what is one thing that the whole world gets wrong about Ukraine? Oh gosh, this is a good one. Um, I would say nobody really believed in Ukraine. People barely knew what it was. They thought it was a part of Russia, whatever. Nobody, yeah. I remember even like talking about where I'm going and people would ask me like <laughs> these stupid questions like, is it part of Russia? Isn't it Russia? What are you talking about Ukraine? So people didn't even know where it was on the map. Uh, nobody really, really talked about it. Uh, but the world quickly realized that Ukraine is much stronger, uh, much more willpowered than what it seemed to be. Uh, there's something about Ukraine that is so special, and it's obviously the people that make it 
to be so special, I would say. And this isn't something that nobody realized. Nobody really realized how strong Ukrainian people are. And it's, it's very much so separated. And these are two different types of people. Uh, Ukrainians are very, very strong. Nobody ever realized that. It's a magical place. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. How about Ukrainians themselves? Uh, what is one thing that they get wrong about themselves? I think they don't give themselves enough credit for how hardworking they are. Okay. That is one thing that I've noticed is Ukrainians are very hardworking. Mm -hmm. They are, <laughs> to the core, hardworking. They are very... Also, one thing about even like what people don't understand about Ukrainians or didn't understand is they are so close with their family. One thing that I really, that was very eye-opening to me was family is everything. Uh, they are so close in relationships and friendships. It doesn't matter uh, who you are, where you are, everyone's going to say hi to you. You move into a, a, an apartment building, that person's going to say hi, your neighbor's going to say hi to you. Uh, just entering and exiting buildings, they all like say hi it, it was very strange to me and people are holding hands on the streets people are walking with strollers i've never seen it for my life I'm like <laughs> like this to be really a daily thing so uh i would say they don't give enough credit to themselves they don't i would say yeah show this mm. so they sh should see that they really are quite incredible people and they're you know. yeah like thinking about this whole situation uh, you know two years of war and if you walk in the streets of Kiev unless there's an air, air raid alert mm. it looks like normal life doesn't yeah, it it does yeah. it's weird it's very weird it, isn't it yeah. yeah it's yeah so what are some of the things uh, that you could share about living in Ukraine during the war time and mm. experiencing it so, on the one hand, we have this, uh, you know, air raid alerts and the war mm -hmm. and all the news. And on the other hand, we have this I impression or image of mm -hmm. a sort of normal life. So, mm -hmm. how do you feel about it? I think people are to get used to it. Uh, you, not everybody has a choice to leave or go somewhere now. Uh, people have started to get accustomed to it, which is strange. It shouldn't be this way at all. Uh, I would say it does seem quite regular. It doesn't seem like uh, something like, like this is going on. Obviously, you see a change, I would say, from before war and now. Obviously, people yeah. are more to themselves. People are a bit quieter for the situation. It's not everybody what is so like, and everybody has a story here. Everybody, yeah. no matter where you were, everybody has a story to tell. Um, and I've experienced it firsthand. Yes. Uh, Teaching English, I hear from students who are all across Ukraine, no matter where they are, even those who have left uh, Ukraine, they still have a story to tell. If they were here f for one day, or if they were here since the war began. Um, but I would say, it's really regular life. I don't know how to explain it. Just, you know, you do what you need to do. You have to go get groceries, you go get groceries, you have to go to the post office, you go to the post office. You don't have much choice, and people are making the best of what it is. We're trying to, I would say. We're trying to. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, looking back at these two years, um, uh, what are some other stories that you would feel, uh, you know, this beautiful and sad and, and, and tragic and at the same time hopeful story that you shared wouldn't be full? So what else? is it that you'd like to share you know with the audience with people around the world because i'm sure there will be a lot of <clears throat> getting emotional too sorry <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, so a lot of people will be uh, watching this and, and thinking like uh how, how is this possible so what else would you like to tell them pray for ukraine <laughs> help you if people here are able in this situation to go out uh, to even give money to, for example, soldiers in this case, when they don't have much. You don't ever know when something's going to happen. They give whatever they can. 
they go out and volunteer, they go and make fences, they go and make gear, they are, everybody's trying to do their part here. Americans, people outside of Ukraine who are living their life like nothing happened, uh, I feel like they could do something to help. They can at least donate. They can at least spread the word. The most minimal thing that you mm. could do is spread the word, which I feel like people have forgotten. And it's very sad because people think uh, there isn't much going on, but it's happening every week. We still recently, two days ago, we woke up to a large uh, drone attack. Yeah. Uh, a week ago, we woke up to a large missile rocket attack. So these are very much so active things, and we hear the explosions no matter where you are. And I'm in Kyiv. I know it's not the worst place in Ukraine uh, right now. Right. There are other areas where they are still occupied or where there are Russian stores nearby right. and much closer to where we are. And for it to be having this stuff to us, and we see the news, we see the damage that happens after these types of attacks, I, I couldn't imagine what's happening in other places. And people have forgotten about it. It hasn't ended. It hasn't. And it isn't ending. So I think people should really uh, spread the word mm -hmm. and do something to, or at least help uh, stop this terrorist yeah. movement. Yes. Thank you, Ali. And I really hope that you will be heard. So, Ali, thank you so much for uh, sharing your story, okay. your incredible story, and uh, for, you know, showing that there is hope, that mm -hmm. Ukraine still lives on, and uh, you're an American girl raising <laughs> a daughter here in Ukraine during yeah. the wartime, and yeah, uh, people you know, shouldn't forget about what's happening here. Yeah, that's true. So um, thank you so much for coming. You're and uh, now you're officially <laughs> Ukraine's storyteller. So there's a special patch. Oh, you can probably wear it. Thank you so I much. Will. I appreciate it. Yeah. And just one little tiny question for the end. If you were to write a book about Ukraine, and I think you should, after sharing this story, it's like you know, a Netflix uh, series at least. So uh, if you were to write a book about Ukraine, what would be the title? I would say the book I would write is Never Take It For Granted. Uh, this would probably be the title. Mm -hmm. I think even just experiencing uh, Ukraine and Europe before this situation happened, I would say people, the difference between the states and here, uh, it's quite major. Uh, people, obviously people are all different. I'm not saying that this is, goes for everybody, but I feel as if people, for example in the States, myself included before, uh, I took everything for granted. I took what we have for granted. I didn't really care much about uh, whatever. I thought that's how it's supposed to be. I wasn't very uh, fully educated and I've shared this many times because I think it's important. Uh, not everybody has as much as we do. Not everybody has clean drinking water. Not everybody has, you know, uh, access to good schools. Nobody, some people don't even, a lot of people don't have cars, even here. Uh, yeah. And we take all of this for granted, you know, the car that our parents buy us at 16, this is obviously an American dream. Uh, you know, going to a very nice school, being able to have a house over our heads, uh, we have a lot of opportunities. Uh, even in Poland, uh, I remember even being at the gym and seeing all these houses and really thinking like, I am so, so lucky and grateful to have what I had. Uh, and coming into Ukraine the same. Uh, not everybody has a chance that we do. And this goes for the average, uh, uh, we could say middle class person. And we, take a lot of things for granted. People now are losing family members. People are losing parents, children. A lot of children have been left without parents from newborn to 18 plus, it doesn't matter. And it's very scary. I couldn't imagine myself losing my parents at three years old. Uh, 
what are you supposed to do? A lot of people are losing their children uh, in this war. It's very sad that mothers, <laughs> me and mother or myself, I couldn't imagine raising, giving birth to a child to be killed, really. But they are doing, are, of course, people are going into the army, to the military, to fight for our country, to fight for the Ukraine. Uh, it's their home. Uh, yeah. And it's very, very unfortunate that, you know, there are people really struggling and really hurting inside and people are being killed on the daily. Not even talking about the rest of the things, uh, you know, where we are lucky or suitable. Uh, but I would say we take things for granted and we really shouldn't. We should be much more grateful. We should be much more thankful. So I would probably write a book, never... Yeah. Never take never things take for, for granted. granted. Never take it for granted. Yeah, because you never know. Tomorrow is a new day. Yeah. But you don't know when it's your last day. Exactly. That's a beautiful title and a beautiful story. Thank you so much, Ali. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening until the end. Um, please make sure to subscribe to our channel and listen to more stories about Ukraine. Um, please support us on Patriot and buy me a coffee. All the links will be added to the description of this podcast. And finally, ah, let's make this the world of stories and not of headlines. See you.